podcast. This is comedian Nazareth, and welcome to episode number 111 in a beautiful, cold Tuesday night here in Southern California. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for uh, uh, 3,200 downloads uh, each time. It's just amazing that you guys are listening and watching. And as you know, uh, this show is called Laughter for All Podcast. In the last five or six weeks, we had comedians in a row from Australia, from Nashville, from other places. But once in a while, we bring someone, either uh, an advocate, either an author, either a, a, a theologian, uh, Mrs. America, Mr. America. We, you know, um, make up artists to the star. Whoever I feel can be a blessing to you and can, you know, encourage you and, and give you hope. I always uh, jump on that and... Tonight's guest is no exception to that. I love this woman. I love what she's doing. And uh, I love her new book that's coming out that she compiled and put together and the ministry that she's with. So uh, in a little bit, I'm going to introduce her to you. But first, I want to uh, already 60 people watching. That's great. Thank you for watching. I'm going to talk, you know, uh, do a, a minute from our sponsor so you can See our sponsor, Professional Botanicals. Those are vitamins that I take every day that help me with my inflammation, arthritis, with blood pressure. It just, just very good. It just brings your system and your immune system to make it a lot stronger, and it just make your body function well. And I, I attest to that. You guys know I started taking them on the air for several weeks. Told you not to buy them until I try them. And they work for me. So uh, here they are. Whether it's physical activity, obesity, diet, smoking, low on hormones, stress, sleep disorders, or your age can be supported by reducing inflammation and aiding the body to heal itself appropriately. A stem cell is a cell waiting to be told what it needs to be. If there is inflammation, that inflammation needs to be stopped. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, kidney disease, various types of cancer, depression, Alzheimer's disease, autoimmune disorders, osteoporosis, even fatty liver are chronic signs of inflammation and can be aided by supporting the body's ability to protect those cells that it needs, removing the inflammation. And that is the purpose of ImmuStem and Adaptostem together, supporting the body to be the best it can be. All right. If you want to get them, you can go to gethealthywithnance.com. It'll be a great Christmas present for yourself. Trust me. All right. Uh, my guest, I've known her for about three years now, a little more. Uh, I got introduced to her through oh, a young man that used you know, to work for me for Laughter for All, became a radio personality in in Bend, Oregon. That's where she's at. With, she lives with her husband in Andy Berger is a co-founder of Buila's Place, a 501c3 nonprofit serving at-risk homeless teens in danger of abuse, trafficking, or other criminally predatory activities. Andy herself, a victim of unspeakable abuse, is a highly sought-after international speaker and advocate for those who cannot speak for themselves. She is also founder of Voices Against Trafficking, an international organization dedicated to the eradication of human trafficking in the U.S. and abroad. Voices Against Trafficking has just released its first book, Voices Against Trafficking, The Strength of Many Voices Speaking as One. It's available on Amazon.com. With degrees in law and in business administration, Andy has enjoyed successful careers, which include corporate training, public relations, education, and media. Her book, A Fragile Thread of Hope, One Survivor's Quest to Rescue, is available on Amazon.com, and 45% of the net proceeds go to victims of child abuse 
and sex trafficking. And he speaks extensively to legisla legislators and human rights groups, universities and churches and organizations around the country to share her testimony and to create greater awareness of our nation's child trafficking epidemic and the dis devastating cost of to America's future. She and her husband, Ed, are celebrating 21 years of marriage this year, as well as the recent adoption of their daughter, who was one of the girls that rescued seven years ago and whose story appeared in Andy's book under the name of Allison. So, hello, 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 and please welcome my good friend, Andy. How are you? Hello, Naz. I'm doing well. It's such an honor to be on your show, and uh, thank you for <laughs> the tremendous introduction. I almost feel like I should get somebody else up here. <laughs> 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 no, where where you're still you're in Bend, Oregon, is that correct? Yeah, just outside of Bend, Oregon, uh, a little place called Redmond, Oregon, but it's not so little anymore. It's growing every day. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, our friend, the auctioneer from Keto. Redmond, Keto. Uh, Keto Keto Olson, yeah. he started after I was at your event. He started watching our Live with Ness show that comes in at 8.30 at night Pacific time on Facebook. And for a long time, he was there every single night. And one, occasionally he checks on us. So that was a great time and a great way to raise money for Buila's uh, home. Okay, you were born. What happened next? <laughs> I want to hear the whole story. You're going to get the whole story. I won't, I won't scrimp, I promise. Um, well, back before there ever was a term called human trafficking, from the ages of six months to 17 years old, my immediate family and some extended family members uh, physically, emotionally, sexually abused and trafficked me. And in the 60s and 70s, they didn't really even talk about child abuse. So let alone something organized, you know, like human trafficking. So there wasn't really a place to go. Um, and when there's trafficking within a family, it's called familial trafficking. And a lot of times the perpetrators are family members and they get away with it because of the bloodline. Well, you know, uh, it, we're not going to interfere because it's the family, right? Or the right. secrets. So... But, you know, Naz, in my life, by the time I was five years old, the abuse and torture and other things were so bad that I thought, you know, I'd, I'd be better off dead. I just want to die. At least I'll be at peace and no one could touch me or hurt me. And my birth mother made it very clear that she could end my life anytime she wanted to. And so I thought, you know, I'm just going to beat her to the punch. I'm just going to go uh, out to the curb and wait for a car to be coming by fast enough so I can jump in front of it and just die. Mm. Because then at least I would be at peace. And I was just five, you know. Uh, so I did. I went out to the curb of our house. And that normally busy street was not busy at all. In fact, uh, it took a long time. I didn't even see one car come down the road. And so while I was waiting, I looked up into this huge sky. And it was so blue. And I was wondering, like, wow, how how big is it? How far does it go? You know, who made it? Is there mm. somebody bigger than the people that are hurting me and threatening me? And mm. so in that moment, you know, in my life, God interceded. I heard this voice from within my heart that said, this is not the plan I have for you. Suicide is not the answer. At five years old. At five years old on that curb all by myself. And for whatever reason, for someone who couldn't trust anybody, I trusted that voice. And I felt a peace, but I didn't know, obviously I was five and I didn't have anyone to talk to. I wasn't allowed to have friends. Everything was controlled, which is what perpetrators do. Mm. But I believed that there was somebody out there that may be bigger than the people who hurt me. So after a while, I went back up and I, I stood against a garage door. And to no one in particular, I just said, if you keep me alive, I'll do whatever you call me to do. So mm. a little kid, you know, that doesn't, wouldn't even know what the word suicide would have meant, you know, let alone talking to someone I couldn't see, but somehow trusted. And obviously I didn't know how hard the road would be because the last time my birth mother tried to kill me, I was 17. <gasps> 
And so the only decent thing my birth father did was pull her off from, off of me before she snapped my neck. And so, you know, again, was she, was she an alcoholic or was she a drug addict or no, just no, none of those things. I think now, you know, there are people that, um, you know, God gives everyone free will and you can do good. You can do evil or you can do nothing, which is pretty much as bad as not do, as, you know, being evil. Um, and there's always somebody who knows, but I mean, think about this. My first memory of my birth mother was when I was about three years old. And uh, my brother and I were curious about what she was making for dinner. You know, we're kids. So we mm. put our hands on the, the door jam and she turned around with this butcher knife in her hand that she was using to cut up meat. And she started screaming and stomping her feet and charging us, like charge coming at us with the butcher knife. Wow. And, and I thought, I, we ran through the house, we went into our bedrooms and I tried to hide under the bed. I thought, I'm gonna get cut up, she's gonna kill me. So at three, that was my first memory. That's so I think some people are just evil or some people just, um, and the hard part too was she did go to church and she felt she had all authority to do whatever she wanted to her children. Wow. Yep. <laughs> Talk about twisted. What? And dad, dad wasn't, was like passive about the whole thing or he didn't know or what? Well, he, he also uh, abused us. Um, they acted kind of independently and, you know, people say, well, why didn't you run away? Well, you know, in the sixties and early seventies, uh, you know, where do you go? And the couple of times I tried to reach out to somebody, they thought they knew better and would send me back. And then I paid a bigger price. Mm. And even when I reached out to a Christian counseling center, I think I was 16 or 17, and I managed to get the phone uh, before anyone was home, and I was trying to find help. And they said, well, we can't help you unless you bring in your parents. Well, if the parents are the problem, right. you, know, you can't get any help. <laughs> so, you know, it was truly God's grace in my life. Um, I didn't even know how to function uh, as an 18-year-old. I had never gone to a movie at night with a friend before by myself, you know, without them being around. And I thought, you know, if I go out at night, I'll be raped or mugged or killed because that's what had been instilled in my brain, uh, right. which perpetrators do. They, they try to mind control you and, and just a lot of things. Plus I had a very prominent speech impediment my, uh, up through my college years. So not only did I have the problems at home, when I was at school or in public and I spoke, it was very noticeable and I felt like a defect. And I was told I was, I was told I was the problem in the family. If I hadn't been born, everything would be better. That I was a mistake that could not be returned. And they would say that publicly, like it was funny. And there was sex trafficking in the house. They were trafficking you or? Well, they wouldn't have called it then, but when an adult, takes a child, transports them in the car, bicycle, whatever, to another place, and they know what's going to happen to that child. In my opinion, that that is trafficking. Because oh, you're taking that's... a minor child somewhere where you know that they're going to be touched or they're going to be hurt that way. And even though there wasn't money exchanged, honestly, if they knew they could have made money off of me or my brother, they probably would have. But again, it wasn't something that was around at that time or not around trafficking's been around a long time, like since man right. was born, but, but they just didn't have a clue. And of course they kept everything locked down. She was a teacher. He was a salesman and the occasion You're... take us to church, you know, people. And you couldn't tell your school teacher that you were being abused. Oh my gosh. I know she would have, my birth mother would have killed me. I mean, we, were constantly told if you tell anybody if you say anything i'll do this i'll do that you won't live to see tomorrow and i mean when you're constantly threatened you believe it you're just a kid right when did the the healing the rescue the when did that start so you're 17 you're still having to deal with your mother you haven't ran from home and no, there wasn't a way to run in Los Angeles for, you know, a kid like me and not knowing anything about, I had no money. I had no friends. The night that she tried, the last time she tried to choke me to death, 
I ran out of the house into the night and I realized that I didn't have anywhere to go. And the police station was two or three miles away. And, you know, Buena Park, uh, not yeah. a great area, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the time. So, you know, I ended up crawling back into the house basically because, and feeling like a failure and a coward because I couldn't even run away. I had no hope. I had no, mm. no way uh, to find anyone that would believe me. And I was still at that time a minor. So they, I would have been taken back. So I turned right. 18 in June and um, went to college uh, in Los Angeles. And that's where I started figuring out a little bit how to how to live on my own. I still had a lot of the self-talk and the, the poor self-esteem and the mind you know, games that they would play. But it was my first physical separation for the most part, um, which helped. But I did the overachiever thing. You know, I finished four years of college and three, got, you know, two degrees. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go to business and I'm going to, you know, save the world, <laughs> you know, do all those things that sounded really good in my head. Um, so I, I applied for law school, got accepted. And I thought, you know, this is great. I'll be able to save kids who are like me. And I felt like that would help me as well. Because, right. you know, at 19, I knew I never wanted to have children. I felt that was the only way to cut the bloodline to stop the evil was to never have um, children. And I even went to a doctor to find out if they could just, you know, shut everything down. And of course, at 19, they weren't going to do that in those days. Right. But that's how 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 passionately I felt about somebody's got to stop this in this generation and this bloodline. So I went to law school and I realized that, you know, um, judges would send kids back to the abusers because they belong with the family, you know, and, mm. and, you know, or they would, um, social services was overwhelmed. So it wasn't really the justice I was looking for. I was looking for God's justice in, in a world system mm. and I finished law. And then I used that in business. And so I threw myself into achieving into being successful, into making a lot of mistakes <laughs> and learning mm. from them. But, you know, working, I, I realized that business taught me a lot of things. You know, if you work harder, faster, better than everyone else, you get noticed. You know, you get mm -hmm. perks, you get special attention, which I had never had. I never had that affirmation that I was valuable, that I was um, decent. Even though I, I went to church, I didn't really have that experiential knowledge of God. I had a very blind faith. So that's what I did. I went I went into business and then I just kept uh, working until I felt like I was an adult, <laughs> independent, but I still had all the baggage and uh, they were still in the area where I lived. I couldn't afford to really move far away. Uh, and then I made a very poor choice and married an abuser. So we fast track through that, even though most people would expect that. Uh, again, you know, someone who went to church and then ended up being someone that had very um, strange proclivities <laughs> and uh, ended up being divorced, something I never thought it would be. And uh, but God, you know, taught me a lot. I learned a lot. And because of that deliverance, which I tell people, you know, deliverance doesn't always come in the package you think it should, but it's still deliverance. Mm. You know? And I prayed that God would release me. And he did. And in a couple of years between um, the end of the, the, the divorce and then meeting Ed, my husband of 21 years, um, I learned uh, a lot about God and who he was and that he was healing me, that he had heard my cries and that it was complicated and the healing would come in layers and, you know, to be patient basically, but that I was not forgotten. And that made a huge difference in my life. When did you feel, when did, what do you call it? When did you feel, okay, you knew that the Lord is blindly, you knew he's going to be with you, he's going to help you since you were five. What age were you felt, that's it, I am born again, I belong to him, this is, you know, he is the Lord of my life. Well, if, if we're talking about the actual salvation, that would have been around eight or nine. Somebody had taken me to, uh, gosh, what do they call it? Awanas, uh, a, a kid's yeah. program at church. Awana. 
Okay. Yeah, Awana. And, you know, I kept asking the Lord into my heart because I couldn't see him. And I, I didn't understand, you know, faith at the time. But at one point, I finally said, you're either in my heart or you're not. So I'm just going to trust that you are. And from that point, I knew that he was there. I didn't understand why I was in the circumstances or why these people were the way they were. But I knew that I wasn't alone. And if I could just hang on long enough, I would be free at some point. What happened to your mother? Um, she, well, gosh, uh, she just passed away like a couple years ago. She was 91 years old. It took her 91 wow. years to pass from this life. And, you know, people say, well, don't you feel bad? I'm like, no, I don't. I didn't kill her. She died of natural causes. Have you ever reconciled or anything? I tried. I tried up until I was 35 years old. I got a lot of flack from people saying, oh, you have to honor your father and your mother and you know, all this stuff. And I'm thinking, I think they actually have to be a mother and a father, you know, um, mm. you know for that. But you know, the theology aside, I'm not a theologian, but at 35, I found out that she was spreading lies and untruths about me uh, to people that I still knew. And I basically wrote her a note and said, you know what? Because I had forgiven her. I'd forgiven my birth father and all the predators in my life. God led me to forgive them and mm. to release that to him, to let him deal with that so that I could be free and move forward. But I did write a note saying, you know, I understand you're speaking these lies. And if you want to have an honest relationship, I would be open to that. But if you're not capable of that, then I really don't ever want to hear from you again. Because after 35 years, Naz, I tried to create mm. a relationship. I tried to be the adult. And uh, the only one that ever got hurt was me. Other, other than your mom, the ones that you forgave, all these people. Now, at you know, we are in Christmas season. And this is a time where a lot of people have to get together with relatives where COVID was a good idea, like, hey, I can't see you. <laughs> I'm coughing. You know what? Uh, yeah. You didn't have to be with relatives. But sometimes you have to get together. And this time of the year, what do you teach someone who's like having a hard time forgiving and probably for something much less than you've ever been to? What do you well, tell them? I, I think it's important one that, uh, First of all, if you're holding on to something, whether it's grudges or hurt or pain or bitterness or, you know, this didn't happen or I'm always poor or I'm always whatever it is, then, you know, you can't be open to God's blessings, to to the richness of that relationship, in my opinion. I think, mm -hmm. you know, and, and because God promises, he, as our pastor will say, it's on God's tab, whatever has been stolen from you, whatever has been done to you, that's on God's tab to deal with. And he's a God of promise and he, he always fulfills his promise. So for someone out there who's struggling, I know it sounds like counterintuitive to let go and to, to forgive that. And I will tell you, I did not do it. I basically told God, there is no way I'm forgiving those people. But because I love you, God, if you help me, if you want me to forgive them, you're going to have to do it through me. And so I remember it taking days and days of constantly letting God have that hurt and letting God have them the perpetrators mm. to do whatever he chose to do with them. And when I did that, I was really free from it because I knew I didn't have to think about it. You know, it would have been nice if my birth mother had passed sooner than later, only because for a victim who's been, whether it's sexual, physical, emotional, mental abuse, the only way you can feel free physically is if that perpetrator is locked up in jail for life or they're dead. Mm. And you, know, you don't usually get either of those. Many people live in pain because their perpetrators are still in town or they're part of the family or, you know, that kind of thing. And so mm. I highly recommend counseling because it does help. And I learned a lot about who I was and um, what I wanted and how to speak my needs without feeling like, I was begging for attention or any of those things. But the forgiveness part, it, it really is for you. It's really out of obedience to God to say, okay, you take this. That's a great advice. That's a great advice. When did Andy, the savior of <laughs> young ladies and sex trafficking victims, started? 
Tell us that journey. It started in 2008. I'd always kind of worked with kids on and off and, and Ed, my husband, same thing with him. And we had Sunday school kids and whatnot. But in 2008, I had the fourth of nine traumatic brain injuries, went down the stairs the wrong way. And I lost like a year of memory. I couldn't work it. I, I had my life stopped and I had no clue what I was going to do because I lost my income and everything. And Thanksgiving Day, we went to serve as we had uh, at the senior center, homeless families. Mm. And and these three three or four girls came in and they all had newborns, you know, uh, in their arms. And they probably weren't 17, maybe 18 at best, but they were living in their cars now and they had no place mm. to go. And the one thing I remember out of the five memories I have of that whole year was that we've got to do something for these teenagers who are on the street that are, they're not criminals. There's a reason they're out there. Maybe they did follow bad boyfriend or bad girlfriend. But the point is, is that the kids we have rescued have run to the streets because it was safer than where they were, what they were running from, whether mm -hmm. their parents were drug addicts or abusers or you know, just whatever the situation was, it was bad enough to drive the kids that we have rescued to the street, hoping there'd be a chance for a better life. And of course, as as you know, the streets are not safe. There, There isn't a homeless no. family, you know, out there waiting for a new member. It's very dangerous. So that's where Beulah's Place uh, got birthed. And we decided, well, what if we feed them, then what? Okay, well, then where do they go? Well, what if we feed them and then, uh, you know, maybe get a warehouse where we could put up a dormitory or something? Okay, but then what do you do with them? How do you get to the root of their issue? So what we did was we created a safe house system with volunteers. So like if you volunteered, you could take one of our teens in. We would work with them for three to five months. And by the end of that time, they would have had a job that they've sustained. They will would have had enough money to move either as a roommate or to rent a cheap room from someone. Mm. And so they would be able to reintegrate with community, which is what God intends. Um, right. As a young adult, they still have to deal with all their stuff of what caused the pain. But at least they can function as an independent, successful adult. Uh, and they don't need the services, the emergency services and all the other crutches and self-medication. Um, when they learn that they have value and they have worth. And so that's now, what started. Uh, any success story briefly that you recall from those stories of the homeless oh. teenagers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, we have seven that we put, uh, put through college uh, that were homeless, but um, one of them in particular, uh, she's just amazing. Uh, her name's Allison. She's in the book. And we ended up adopting her officially. She asked us to adopt her a couple of years ago uh, in her mid-20s. But um, her, her father was a religious leader. He violated her uh, for her young life. The mother divorced him. She, the mother became an alcoholic and decided to spend more time with her boyfriend than with her child. The only time she came home is when Allison either tried to take her own life or there was a problem, you know, that the school would call about. So this mother left her child home six days a week from age 12 to age 16 with frozen food in the freezer. And she'd check on her once a week to make sure she was still alive. But this kid still, she put herself through rehab. She kept a 3.2 GPA during high school, even though it took her till she was 20 to get her diploma. She didn't quit. She kept moving forward. And she, we got her probably a couple of days after her 18th birthday. Uh, she mm. lived with us on and off. We've had a lot of teenagers live with us. Um, but the, the bottom line is she's straight A. She's going to be a psychologist. She's going to help kids that are like her, that were like her. And this was someone that we almost lost a couple of times to uh, uh, suicide or drug addiction because it's so hard for these kids to deal with the kind of pain. And I'm so mm. grateful that, you know, God would allow Ed and I and our our 60s to be a mom and dad officially. <laughs> oh, that's so you kept your promise. You didn't want to have kids. You didn't have kids, but that's maternal right. kids. That's right. Now, <laughs> what do you say? How do you think we can fix this problem in the churches <laughs> where a lot of churches try a lot, not all, 
mm-hmm. I think were to cover up stuff. Uh, especially sometimes there's an abuse, a hu- abusing husband, abusive husband that looks good before the church. Right. So everybody loves him and respect him, and they think the wife has just to shut up and and be nice and just listen to him and try. Like she's the cause of the problem, not knowing he's a verbal abusive. Right. You know, me- mental. You know, not just uh, not physically, but. Uh, what do you how how can we help that? How can we help stop maybe leaders who are molesting their children or they're abusing their children? What do you well, think? That, that is a very big question. Um, and part of it is okay to to one point in terms of the situation with trafficking or abuse. Churches have to learn how to approach the subject, how to look at it. Like I said, I had a lot of people who were very religious, who knew the Bible inside and out, telling me, you know, that I, you know, it it was my fault that these things had happened and that it was, you know, I had to make it right with the parents, you know, because that's what the Bible said. I mean, seriously, I had people uh, tell me that, which only made it harder, you know, to to heal. So one thing is we have to open up and say, you know what, we need to have this conversation. And as a pastor or a preacher or whoever, I might not be able to bring it, but I could find someone like an Andy Berger who would come and talk to the congregation or who would um, bring both the message and the hope of the situation, but also, you know, not scare people to death. Um, so yeah. if, if we were really strong about representing Jesus Christ to everyone, then we would not be afraid of what people thought about our church for talking about it. And for the people that do violate in church, a lot of our kids will hurt in church. You know, I couldn't talk to anyone in church because, again, it would be my fault. Okay, Mm. so I didn't have that option. I was speaking and I had a lady who was 75 years old. And when I was done, she came. She said, you know, I've never told anybody this before, Andy. She said, but I was violated at five in the back of a church. What do Uh. I do? 75 years old, she had great grandchildren. Her whole life, she lived with that horrible secret. And so we Uh, talked about things, but can you imagine carrying that load your whole life? There's a whole world of walking wounded. And and I guess, you know, to your, your, your question, first of all, if you know or suspect something, please say something. Because if you do, you may save a child's life. You may save pain. Forget about the image in the neighborhood or at the social group or at bridge or at the church. We have to have the courage to say, this is wrong. I don't like what you're doing. You know, either deal with it, fix it, or we're going to take action because we have to allow that communication to happen. Our children will never trust us. They have no no, no right to trust us if we are not a- allowing them to communicate their deepest hurt. I have a question, but then, and after that, I will ask uh, uh, about your first book. But, uh, well, well, first, it's a comment, bless you. The first comment is there's a church, a huge church in Australia. That's what's going on, where someone actually went to the church and told them what happened to her by one of the pastors, and they tried to cover it up. And yeah. You know, unfortunately, I think it's us Christians who need to deal with that. And that's why your your ministry is so valuable and you're speaking so valuable is because you don't want someone from the world that's come and attack the church or look at you, you guys. This is no, it's within the church to say, Hey, this is wrong. It's not the reputation of this the reputation doesn't matter. God God protects the reputation of his church. But we need to talk about these things and we need to open up. Now, a uh, question for you. Sure. With all that abuse, as a, how were you and Ed be able to have this wonderful relationship? Well, first of all, we know who our first love is, both of us. You know, that's Jesus. Okay, we, we respect that. And I think with Ed, it was amazing. I'm probably going to scare some people now, but uh, he waited two weeks before he practiced his proposal. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I, I don't know where it came from. It must have been Holy Spirit because on the third, when we went to church the third week after we had met, it just happened. I just said, I love you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I broke all the rules and zones or whatever else, you know, they were talking about women breaking rules back then. But uh-huh. you know, like he said, I was waiting for you. I didn't want to rush you. And that here are two things that, um, 
that made the most impression other than God telling me that this man would not do what everyone else had done to me and I, that I needed to stay because I was nervous, you know, having had a failed marriage, even though I was abused, I still took my responsibility, my promise very, you know, seriously. Um, mm. And uh, he said, I don't know everything that happened to you, but I will never leave you and I will always listen. And that is the best thing anyone can do for someone who's been hurt um, to any degree. All pain is relative. You don't have to have my background to have pain. Um, but that, you know, we've shared that with our kids all, all the time. And unfortunately, there are so many Christians who deal more in religion than they do in faith. And what I mean is when you have faith, you have a relationship with God, with Jesus, with Holy Spirit. And because of that love relationship, each partner, each per, you know, each partner should want the best for the other. But right. it's amazing how many people in church, oh, look at what she wore. Oh, I heard she did that. Or, oh, you know, he was flirting with, you know, whatever. That's not our business. That's not what we're there to, to uh, talk about. I don't believe. If we right. work on loving one another, and loving one another means being there for the hard times too not just the good times, not just the socials, not just the activities or vacation Bible school, but representing Christ. Do you really think he'd be wagging his finger at people? I don't think right. that's what he died for. You know, there's a uh, Timothy said, Christians should step up and protect and speak up for the hurt and abuse, plain okay. and simple. Uh, Larkin said, you're so, you're courageous, Andy. Oh, this is awesome. You. You're, you're really touching. Life. Tell us about your, uh, let me see, uh, your first book. And it's called, uh, uh, the book is called A Fragile Thread of Hope. So tell us about that. Well, that was not the book I thought I would write first. <laughs> I was really hoping I'd never have to say anything, you know, publicly other than, you know, what I chose to. But God called my heart. He gave me a great writer, Kay Farish, who did an extraordinary job of bringing a tough topic and making it um, readable and, and palatable. So the book basically goes a little bit more into my experiences and my, my testimony. It also has four stories of kids that we've personally rescued. Uh, not all were trafficked, some, you know, why they went to the streets. So it kind of gives people an idea of who these teens really are. Yes. Are some of them rebellious? Absolutely. I mean, who wasn't rebellious at some point? But these kids are not those kids. They're not the criminals. They're the victims. And so the book at the end is kind of a toe in the water hope book. And it, it gives a little update on the, on the kids. But uh, when that came out, it really was, I literally did hang by a fragile thread of hope when I was five, because for a kid to listen to a voice that they had never heard and to trust it and believe it, that somebody was out there, you know, and to go through everything that um, I went through, uh, every time, you know, that rope got thicker, I was stronger. And so that's, that's kind of the goal of the book is to educate folks and we do give proceeds back to victims of child abuse or child sex trafficking from that book. Wonderful. Uh, now, it, it says that every 40 seconds a child is abducted uh, in the U.S. So explain to people who don't know, like they hear the word trafficking, trafficking. Right. What is traffic? What is trafficking? Well, the simple, the simple definition is... Um, where a person is usually a child or, or 18 or under a college student, very young, uh, is usually uh, taken or used for labor or sex services, for trade, for profit, uh, against their will. They're coerced into it or they're tricked into it or they're simply abducted. Um, the U.S. Marshal Service Director, uh, Donald Washington, he is the one that gave us that statistic every 40 seconds in America, just in our country, that doesn't include all the other countries in the world, but just in our country, a child 18 years or younger is abducted. That means they're taken, they've been lured into a trap. These are not the runaways. You know, now they may, some of them may have run away from a situation thinking they were going to a safer one, but they'd find out very quickly that it wasn't safe. There are actually uh, recruiters on college campuses that are paid to target potential product for sex trafficking. Wow. So 
So, so during this show, 10 children has been abducted just from the beginning of this show, just to give you an idea, people, how serious this issue is. Yeah, every 40 seconds. I mean, that's like one in a third kid every minute. So that's a lot of children that are gone and, and people, they're not, we're not paying attention to, well, why, why is that kid not here anymore? Or where did that, you know, uh, where did that boy go? And boys and girls are vulnerable, are vulnerable, uh, probably girls more so, uh, they're a little bit more in demand, but think about this, a child that is abducted, uh, 18 years or, or under, once they're in a sex trafficking ring, um, they'll be sold 20 times. 25 times a day or night, which means they're usually drugged. The average lifespan of a sex trafficking victim is seven years if they're lucky. And only wow. 100 usually escape. And because of our lack of understanding as a global community, oftentimes when the ones who do escape actually end up killing their predator, they're usually put in jail. So wow. we have a lot of things to fix. And thank you that you're around and that people like you are doing that. Uh, so what can we personally, as, as individuals who don't, we're not in office, we're not uh, in, with the police department, what can we do personally to help stop that or slow that down? Well, the first thing is, you know, if you see something, say something. Your gut's probably right, but it's better to be safe than sorry, especially where there's a victim involved. Um, you know, now you can't just go around charging people, you know, with a crime, but you can ask your local law enforcement office, hey, what do you want us to report? What should we be looking for? Because it might be different in every town. Um, so, you know, get the information, be educated. Another thing that you can do is on our website for Beulahsplace.org or VoicesAgainstTrafficking.com, we have listed hotlines and helplines. Go to those sites and put them in your cell phone. Put them in your kids' cell phones if they're old enough to understand what they're for. Have a way to call or text for help if you think there's something going on. And again, encourage your churches, your social organizations, chambers of commerce to have speakers, to be involved in um, the solution. And, and with Voices Against Trafficking, one of the things we're doing is we have an Add Your Voice campaign. You can go to the website and simply, you know, email us saying, hey, add my, add my voice because we want to get a roster of 1 million names by the end of summer 2023. So that this way we have seven or eight members of Congress from both sides of the aisle that support us and are, are trying to help us get further. But we want every member of Congress, every governor, every attorney general to know that we have these names and we have a group of people that are, are dedicated to, to mm. doing what we have to do. Don't vote for somebody if they can't tell you how they're protecting their children. You know, if your community is struggling with this issue, then, you know, use your power as a voter, as a contributor, take it away. If, if they can't give you an answer on, well, you know, this is what we're doing to help protect our kids, right? Right, right. Let me show the book that you, I know this book you compiled, you put, it was your idea, and you compiled this book. So let me just uh, tell us a little bit. Voices Against Trafficking, the strength of many voices speaking as one. Uh, tell us a little bit about that book. Yes. Uh, one of the reasons that was God inspired a couple of years ago in January of 2020 uh, because I, I kept hearing in the middle of the night, it would wake me up, more voices. We need more voices. And so uh, Voices Against Trafficking, any individual company, nonprofit, church, whatever, can, can join, be part of our, our, our organization simply by adding their name. And like the wheel of a, uh, of, a, of a bike, there's spokes. So all of those spokes, we're the hub, and all of the organizations retain their individuality but what I did was I said, look, how about we create a book, another tool in our tool belt uh, against human trafficking that we can get to every member of Congress, we can get out to the public that gives them tips on how to keep their kids safe, that have survivor leader stories like mine, that have something for a victim, like I wrote a chapter on PTSD for this particular edition. 
every year we're going to bring new voices from around the world that are writing chapters so that every year there's fresh information there's a tool that you can use as an everyday person put it in your home library talk to your kids and teenagers about it talk to your college students put it in your church library make sure that people have access to real information and um, that's part of the plan we also do free forums like your podcast every quarter we have an international forum that's free on facebook and youtube and we bring speakers from homeland security from the border from all over the world to give five or ten minutes about what's happening uh, what's working what isn't working so that the public can be educated and feel more empowered to say you know what i do want to be part of the solution right right so what kind of what tips can someone take okay i'm a parent i have one daughter in college another one is 14. What kind of what kind of tips? What tips? What advice do you give us, to as parents, maybe grandparents, maybe uh, an uncle and aunt who cares about their nephew or niece? Sure, sure. Um, any guardian, let's call it, whether it's a parent, a grandparent, aunt, uncle, whoever of your child or children. First thing I tell people is, does your family have a safe phrase or a safe word where, let's say, your fourteen-year-old goes out with a group of kids or people and maybe they feel uncomfortable they don't feel safe um can they text you something that tells you hey you know i'm in trouble or i just need you to come get me you know have a word or a phrase that only your family knows so when you get that message or you get a call you know that it's truly coming from your child that is concerned afraid maybe in trouble okay the other thing is if you have younger children uh, well, and even up to teenagers, do you have a plan for if uh, there is a predator that enters your home or your apartment or your trailer, is there a way for them to escape? Have you talked about that in a very calm way, you know, about here's what you need to do? Or if I'm not home because I'm working, there are a lot of two parent, uh, you know, people working multiple jobs these days. Mm -hmm. Is there another safe adult that you vetted that your child can go to? or that they can call, or that you can have check in on them. Not because you're policing them, have the conversation that this is not about, you know, trying to police what you're doing. This is about making sure you're safe at all costs. And when you have that respectful conversation, um, it, it works out better than saying, well, you know, you know, we don't think you're, you know, uh, mature enough to understand, so we're gonna do this for you. You know, nobody wants to feel like they're being babysat. But the other thing, too, again, have a conversation, discuss that not everybody is safe. And the only reason you want to know where they're going is in case they're in trouble. You know, that's it. And leave it very simple, because a lot of a lot of times we feel like we have to control their circumstances. But you cannot control a predator. You cannot control how sneaky and how stealth like they are. And if your children don't feel like they have the chance to make mistakes and be okay, like not have you be mad at them, you know, just, hey, whatever it is, we'll figure it out. We'll talk about it later. But right now I wanna make sure you're safe, that you're okay. Because that's when they will sneak out to the movie theaters or they will go to that party that they should not be going to. Mm, you're right. And you're, Thanks. you know, that. yeah, as a parent you do, you deal with these issues. I mean, thank God for phones right now and technology to where you can find out where your child is. Uh, but that still gets them upset. Like, why are you, why are you tracking me? Oh, well, I'm not tracking. I just want to make sure you're in your apartment at mm -hmm. this time of the night. You know, stuff like that. Right. But you're right. You gotta have this understanding that we're not policing you, but we're actually want to make sure you're safe. And that's. Uh, and that they can tell you anything, even if it bothers you. Like if your child has a problem with an adult teacher at school, for example, you want them to tell you about that without judging them for it, you know, and uh, trust and verify, trust the fact that they have had an experience, but then verify what exactly did happen and, and allow for the fact that your child may be trying to tell you something very important. And that will be the, the the defining moment in your relationship with them, how you respect that information. And it may terrify mm. you. It may, it may make you uncomfortable, 
but isn't it better to be uncomfortable and take care of your child? You know, that, because that they will live with that forever. That's right. That's right. Wow. When you speak, what do you mostly speak? I mean, I know you talk about sex trafficking. What is one of the nuggets you leave people with? One of the nuggets is um, I totally believe in hope, that fragile thread of hope that sustains yeah. me. We can do more about this issue, absolutely. But every time even one child is saved or one kid is um, not bullied or you know any of that, it's a win. And we need to accept that sometimes that mustard seed, you know, is all we get to see right now. But down the road, it, you know, there'll be a lot of different things. So one of the things, the reason I speak, I mean, I could be talking about Betty Crocker recipes, but, <laughs> but for such a time as this, God has called me to let people know, one, about the issue, two, that between awareness and education, we can do something, and three, that if someone who felt like yesterday's garbage all her life, you know, until, you know, 20 years ago, can be used, then anybody can be used. And if God can take something that was so broken and shattered and ugly and messy and stinky, like I was, and, and use me and make something beautiful out of it, then, you know, there is hope. But the only way those victims have hope is if we actually get out of our comfort zone and start having conversations to begin with and then move to action. So, yeah, when I speak, I want to leave people with hope that we can do this. We've done it. Ed and I have worked with 300 kids in the last 13 and a half years. It's a lot Praise of kids. God. <laughs> How can people, number one, donate to your ministry? What the, You're a 501c3. If people yes. are watching now, today, tomorrow, in a year or so, how can they donate to your ministry? Where can they go? Well, we would love for them to go to voicesagainsttrafficking.com. We are a 501c3 now. Um, but uh, go to voicesagainsttrafficking.com and there are membership. You can be a lifetime member for $50, you know, and if that's too much, then, you know, whatever you'd like to donate will help us continue um, designing materials, getting the word out, going. I've spoken on Capitol Hill. You know, I'll go anywhere to help get this situation turned around. But what we also do is take care of kids um, that are sent to us or given to us. We feed them. We make sure they have clothing, that uh, they get education if they need it. But you can do all of that through VoicesAgainstTrafficking.com. Uh, yeah, just oh, email. <laughs> yeah. Debbie Malone from Louisiana, she asked this question. Uh, is there a global hand signal that children can use to alert others in public that they are kidnapped? I think I've seen one in uh, TikTok where they do a certain hand sign that the younger people know, hey, I'm in trouble, do something. That is true. Um, I'm going to have to give you the other side of that coin, though, just to be fair. The predators also know what that sign is. And so... Uh, you have to be very careful. I think it's great if you see that sign, act on it. You know, the worst case is you could be wrong. But just know that some of those young people are also being used by predators to, to attract other uh, individuals, other kids. So like everything, the more we promote and we, we talk about it, uh, the predators get pretty sneaky and they get pretty pretty crafty with uh, what they use. Just like back in the day when they would use a male and female on the side of the road with a broken car and then somebody would stop and then they would rob them. You know, it's kind of along those same lines. So just uh, proceed with caution when you see that. It's a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, we're finding now that the predators are kind of onto it. All right. Sarah's saying, uh, having worked with, in child care, we always had to be on the lookout for those who didn't wreck we didn't recognize near the facilities and such. So that's another thing. And let's see. Yes. Uh, so I want to, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. And I want to know if people want to book you as a speaker at their church or at their, you know, uh, chamber of commerce or whatever, a company or um, an organization that deals with children or with uh, trafficking, how can they get a hold of you? 
Uh, go to voicesagainsttrafficking.com, and when you uh, fill out the contact information, it comes directly to me. And so I will definitely respond. I uh, respond to everyone that I can, uh, usually pretty quickly. So yeah, feel free to contact me. And if you have questions or things that I can answer, I'm happy to do that. So voicesagainsttrafficking.com. Go to the contact. Uh, send me your name and let me know, you know, what you'd like, and we'll make it happen. Yes, and if you want to order the book, you can go to Amazon and their voices of trafficking. And we can't wait for the second book to come out, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> third and the fourth. So, Andy, <laughs> you want to write a chapter now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And I think I'm going to ask Debbie Martis, my friend who runs uh, several homes uh, in in Riverside County to maybe write a chapter or to connect with you. Sure. That's what they do that as well. So thank you for your time. Merry Christmas to you and Ed. Yes, yes, to you also and to everyone who's been watching and listening. Bless you guys for being there and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the encouragement and all that. We appreciate you, Andy. Uh, all right. When you, thank you guys for watching tonight and you know, let your friends know about these songs. Some, we're not always being funny, but sometimes we're really giving some life-changing advice and some advice that would help someone, the, you know, on what to do about it. So thank you guys for watching. Please let people know to subscribe to the Laughter for All podcast. Also tonight at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook under Comedian Nazareth. We're going to have the Live with Naz episode number 375 where we get to laugh for an hour and then we get to uh, see what kind of prayer you need so we can pray for you the, the next day. Love you guys. Thank you so much for watching and have a great night. Good night.